Hi everyone. Okay, so up until now, we've been looking at the evolution of everything around us and how life about came about and how um, everything, you know, evolves and all sorts of other good stuff. But today's lecture is going to be a little bit different because it's on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. It's one I'm really interested in. And today we're going to talk about the evolutionary impact of humans and how we've altered everything around us in our environment. So the impact we've had on, on our environment and everything around us has actually drastically changed over time. So if you think about evolutionary history, um, we all started out as scavengers and then eventually hunters and gatherers, okay? And when we were hunters and gatherers, we didn't have a huge impact on the environment. We did have some, but not as much as would happen later on. So we'll come back to the exact impacts of this type of a lifestyle, but just realize that our footprint at this point on the environment was relatively kind of low-ish. As a society, eventually we would shift from hunters and gatherers to agriculture. And to be honest, this is what allows for our way of life that we know and love today. Being able to grow enough food to have a surplus is what allows us to live in large cities and all sorts of other stuff. And once we did shift to agriculture, our impact on the environment definitely stepped up quite a bit because we started to change our environment all around us to better suit what we wanted. Then would come the Industrial Revolution. So think back in history, okay, your history classes that you guys thought you would never have to think about again. You know, I always say, learn from history and definitely learn your history. Those who don't, what is it? Those who don't learn it are doomed to repeat it. Learn our history, okay? So once the Industrial Revolution hit, this, of course, is when our way of life shifted and we started relying on machines and we started relying on mass production and people started to move to cities. This is when our impact on the environment would really, really step up because, of course, you know, once you start mass producing things, you have things like pollution and clearing the way for the factories and a lot of concrete and all sorts of other things that are really important in, you know, in altering the environment. So we also know that humans have evolved and changed over time, okay? Now, don't panic when you see this particular figure. So we're talking about millions of years ago on the y-axis, and so going from 0 to 8 million years ago. And then on the x-axis is the different species of humans, okay? What I want you to get from this is, first of all, Homo sapiens have not been around that long. We like to think we have, but as we've talked about in this class, we really haven't. The other thing I want you to get from this is there were actually other species around at the same time as us, okay? So the Neanderthals were around, and by the way, science has suggested that we actually exchange genes with them. How cool is that, okay? So we have genetic signals of the Neanderthals in us, but we also existed at the same time as a few other species. That's all I want you to get from this, okay? And it's interesting that somehow we managed to be the only species to survive. Nobody really knows why. Personally, my hypothesis is that I don't think Homo sapiens play well with others, but you never know, and um, that's a wild hypothesis without much foundation. So just something to consider, though, is that at one point in time, a while back, there were multiple species of humans wandering around. So the Neanderthals, we did exist at the same time as them, as I said, and we do share genes with them, which means that there was some interbreeding. The interesting thing about them, though, is they always maintain the hunting-gathering lifestyle. But that might have actually been what led to them to become extinct, okay, whereas we shifted to agriculture and were able to then do much better because we could actually have a surplus of food. So, again, Homo sapiens, um, the initial lifestyle, of course, focusing on hunting and gathering. And I also would say that we were probably scavengers, too. So, you know, no point in tossing away a perfectly good dinner if you happen to come across one that's already deceased. So, you know, again, hunting and gathering. But in the next slide, we're going to talk about why we shifted away from hunting and gathering, because there were a lot of good things about that lifestyle, but also a whole lot of bad things about it as well. So think to yourself for a minute. You can even pause the lecture here if you want. What would be some good things about hunting and gathering, and what would be some bad things about that lifestyle? So let's talk about the lifestyle of hunting and gathering. So when you're a hunter and gather, you're either fully or semi-nomadic. Okay, that means you're constantly moving around. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that you basically take everything you have with you at all times. Now, I don't know about all of you, but over time, I've accumulated way too much stuff. <laughs> Maybe this is because I'm old. But I could not imagine this lifestyle where you have to constantly carry everything with you. Because of that, you're basically going to live in small communities, okay, because everybody has to shift as a unit. Also, low population densities. Like it or not, you can't have too many children at one time because if you do, you're not going to be able to pick them up and carry them with you. 
Okay. On the plus side, no political fish officials. Yay. <laughs> that one's got my vote. Okay. Also, little wealth differentiation because everybody's got to work together. You're basically specialized only by age and gender. Okay. And like it or not, the labor was generally divided with women gathering wild plants and men tend to fish and almost always do the hunting because from a physical perspective, you had to be really stealthy at that because um, there are some serious consequences if you didn't do it right. Now, with this lifestyle, they would have to migrate often because they would have to follow the food. So you're ma mainly nomadic because you have to take your family with you. For that reason, you tend to have a low number of children. So one child, maybe two at the max because you have to pack them up and take them with you. Also, initially, they relied on more simple tools for hunting and fishing, okay? And then they also tended to be focused on survival. So there's no art. There's no time for anything extra. You're just trying to find your food and survive. Over time, our technology, even as hunters and gatherers, would develop. So we started to use more sophisticated tools, and our hunting skills developed, and we became more efficient. One of the most important factors that came about, at least according to anthropology, would be the Clovis spears. And once we had the Clovis spears, we became a much more effective hunters. And in fact, this might have actually caused a lot of mammal extinctions, okay, especially the large mammals, because we became much better at hunting them. And as we're going to see later on, this probably, you know, wherever humans went, we tended to have extinction events too. So we moved across lands and environments, and this is also when we really started to spread out across the earth and a lot, had a lot of migrations out of Africa. By the way, everybody came from Africa. Okay, so all of the humans, Homo sapiens, we all came from Africa. It was just a matter of what wave and what time and that type of thing. It's interesting. We all have a pretty cool history. So what's interesting and sort of sad, but from a science perspective interesting, is as humans moved around, um, unfortunately we started to take out a lot of the large mammals. At least that's the hypothesis. For example, we had woolly mammoths in North America, we had giant sloths in North America, we had big cats in North America, big birds, and wherever humans went, unfortunately, extinctions followed, as we will show in the next figure. So what I like about this figure is the fact that it shows, first off, where humans were and when. So as I said, we all came from Africa, and if you look at Africa, 130 to 170,000 years ago. Now, unfortunately, some species there did go extinct as we became more efficient hunters. Then what would happen is we would move out, okay, so we would hit certain areas like Europe between 40 and 50,000. We would hit areas like India and, and beyond 60 to 70,000. And what I want you to get from this is they're showing in this slide what mammals went extinct, which happens to be approximately when humans got there, by the way. But also the fact that North America was colonized last. Hint, hint, North America colonized last. Okay, and it happened over the Bering Land Bridge when we were at the height of a glacial period. And so horses in North America also went extinct. Remember I told you that in the very beginning of the class. Isn't it great when everything ties together that humans overhunted horses? Okay, and so the ones that we have today in North America were brought over from the conquistadors. But then eventually we would all, they, humans in general would make their way to South America too. But it was one of the last areas to be colonized because we were slow to get there. So you don't have to memorize this. Okay, do know that we used mitochondrial DNA to show the human migration patterns. When you sample humans today and you look at the mitochondria, it kind of says where our history is. And then also know, just have an idea of what animals went extinct. Okay, again, you don't have to remember that many details, but it's kind of fascinating from a scientific perspective. Kind of sad, too. So again, we've said it before that the horses in North America um, initially went extinct. They looked a little bit different than the horses we know and love today. So the picture on the left is a depiction of horses based on the fossil record, what North American horses look like. And then the picture on the right are those that are descendants of the conquistadors horses um, that came over from Spain. And there's definitely some subtle differences. You can also figure, though, that the niche of horses in general existed. Okay. And so it's easy to see why the horses, when they were brought over by the conquistadors, that they would do so well because unfortunately we had hunted all of the wild horses, but, you know, grass was still there and their niche was still there and it was, you know, perfect for them to just come in and flourish and do really well.
So this is just a slide to remind you that the Spanish conquistadors were the ones who brought the horses over. And um, yeah, that's why we have the horses today over here. Now the hypothesis that where humans went, eventually there was too much hunting and we caused many species to go extinct is called the overkill hypothesis, okay? So it is just a hypothesis. The data to me is pretty interesting and honestly I kind of think this is what happened or that it was a combination of things and we'll talk about that in a little while. But what this figure is meant to show is the green is a survival of large mammals in certain areas like Africa, Australia, North America, and Madagascar. And the black arrow represents when humans got there. Okay, so we know humans evolved in Africa. And you can see that there was definitely a dip in the number of surviving large mammal species. In Australia, you can see there that there's, you know, once again, the arrow hits and there's a huge loss of those species. Then North America, same same pattern, Madagascar, same pattern, okay? So this is why people suggested, scientists suggested that we hunted, overhunted too much. Now you might be asking yourself, why is it Africa still has a large number of, you know, big mammals? And that'd be an excellent question. The current hypothesis suggests that those guys evolved with us and so they learned to avoid us. Whereas in all the other continents, that wasn't necessarily the case. Australia had never seen humans. North America, same deal. Madagascar, same deal. Okay, so again, it is a hypothesis and there are alternate ex potential explanations for this. Um, but the evidence to me, I think is, you know, there's definitely a pattern there. And from a science perspective, super fascinating. A human one, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, I hate seeing extinctions, so. Now, the reason there's still a controversy over this, of course, is the fact that um, there are, thank you, there are, um, the fossil record is incomplete, and we've talked about this. So we know how fossils are made. We covered this in the very beginning of the semester. Something has to die, get covered really quick with sediment, okay, and then add some heat and pressure. We also know that the fossil record is really biased, and so there's really, you know, it's very far from imperfect, and so that's why this is still up in the air. We also know that there are many different categories of fossils. We've talked about this before. There's unaltered remains. Same is true form fossils. There's trace fossils, mold and cast. You guys have already seen this. And so um, just a reminder, once again, everything comes together in the end. Yay! <laughs> We also know that there are many issues with the fossil, fo ugh, fossil record. So most fossils haven't been found. The animal plant groups are not equally represented. You know this. Many fossils get destroyed. Okay, so because everything is so far from perfect, this is why that, you know, there's such a controversy over what caused the extinction of so many large mammal species. So you might be asking yourself, what would you need with regards to evidence to solve this controversy? And I would say, aha, that is an excellent question. So basically you would need to find a lot of bone fragments, okay, or bone fossils, where you saw evidence that there was, um, they were hunted. So, you know, bone chipping, Clovis spears, all that type of thing. And the fossil record just has not been, you know, abundant in that. Because think about it, the likelihood of finding an animal where it's been interpreted that they were killed due to hunting. We know the fossils don't preserve perfectly, so many issues. And so that's why this is still sort of up in the air. So you might be asking yourself, well, if it wasn't an overkill, what was it? And so the other hypothesis, of course, is the natural climate variation, which, as you all know, was caused by the Milankovitch cycles. So remember, the Milankovitch cycles are, you know, variation in Earth's orbit and tilt and rotation, okay, which are pictured here. And so once again, we talked about this in the beginning of the class, and here we have it again. Remember that Earth's climate naturally changes. It's been much warmer than it is now, and it's been much cooler than it is now. That's just part of the way Earth cycle goes. What this figure here is meant to illustrate is going from present day, which is on the x-axis to the left, um, to a million years ago, which the x-axis going across the bottom, and then the temperature on the y-axis is the bottom is cold and the warm is top. Here we have showing the interglacial period where it's warm, followed by a glacial period with an interglacial glacial. You can see how the temperature of Earth has gone up and down and up and down naturally over time. Well, the reason that's happened is because of the Milankovitch cycles. So if, in fact, it was climate change, that could potentially cause a lack of food that, you know, the large mammals needed, also very stressful, okay? And there's a YouTube video that I'm going to include in the announcement today, so you'll be able to watch the YouTube video on an alternate hypothesis 
Honestly, it could also be both climate change and overkill, okay, that caused the extinction of so many large species. There is no reason that, you know, it has to be one or the other. So we also know that there's many modern extinction events. So modern, I mean within the last hundred years. So the passenger pigeon is one story, okay, of birds that have gone extinct. Believe it or not, we used to have parrots in North America. And what's pictured here is a, a, a Carolina parakeet. But you can imagine, with such brightly colored feathers, the reason they became extinct is because they were overhunted for those feathers for ladies' hats in the early 1920s and 1800s. So we also know, of course, the West African black rhinos are down to dangerous levels if there's any even still alive. I think there was one or two, last I checked. But also the quaggas, which are pictured above, they kind of look like a cross between a zebra and a horse. But they were their own distinct species at one time, and again, they did go extinct with humans being around. So the good news, though, is that nature seems to be evolving in response to pressures from humans. And maybe that will be one of the things that helps a lot of these species hang around. My favorite example is the elephants. Now, I absolutely love elephants. My husband says it's because they're large grazers and I can identify with them because they eat all day. Yeah, he's not wrong, <laughs> okay? But elephants are a great example. So initially... Um, most elephants are born with tusks because that's what attracts mates. However, there are a small fraction of elephants that are born without tusks. Those are the tuskless. Initially, a hundred years ago, the percentage of tuskless elephants was really low, like 3%, 4%, 5%, something like that. But in this day and age, the percent of tuskless elephants being born is around 12 to 15%, which is a huge jump. And of course, those without tusks are not hunted, so they seem to be doing fine. So yay, go nature! Bighorn sheep, pictured to the right, are also very often hunted for their large horns. Well, on average now, they're being born with much smaller horns because they tend to be doing better. Fish on the bottom right, many species of fish, which unfortunately have been overfished, um, humans tend to fish for the large ones, and it used to be that certain species had to be a large size to reproduce. Well, now they're starting to be able to reproduce at smaller sizes due to evolutionary pressure, which is a great thing because then they can reproduce before they get caught. So, you know, whereas before they would get caught and not be able to reproduce. So that's a good thing. And last but not least, certain um, bird species, uh, cliff swallows, for example, have actually adapted to and now can live under bridges, and they're learning, believe it or not, to avoid avoid cars. So nature seems to find a way, which is a wonderful thing. Now the hunter and gather and lifestyle worked for a while for humans, but realistically speaking, there are some definite <laughs> limitations. So you had to have small population size, had to keep moving around. As I said, I have way too much stuff. I told my husband long ago, I hope he's comfy in this house because we're dying here. I'm never moving again. Um, and dependent upon nature, and it also could be dangerous. So if you hunted something that had a bad attitude and it decided to turn on you, there was a good chance you were going to die. So lots of downsides to hunting and gathering, whereas agriculture could have a lot of upsides. One of the reasons we shifted to agriculture is you can support a lot more people in a population. Okay, that's a good thing. You can grow a surplus of food and store it up for a bad year. So, you know, that's a definite plus. Also, you don't need to carry the young around all the time because you can be sedentary, which has my vote, um, <laughs> less dangerous, okay, than hunting and gathering. And once again, because you don't need to move around, you can have a surplus of food and then, you know, have it for the next year. Now, it's not as if all of a sudden humans flipped a switch, okay, and then went from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And what's interesting about that is it actually seems that there was trading back and forth between hunters and gatherers and domestic, um, people who were agriculture, and they would actually trade domestic pigs and so forth. So that part's pretty cool, and that's what the um, genetic data seems to find as shown here. And if you guys want to look up that study, um, it, you can just look up the author and read on it. It's pretty interesting. You can imagine, though, that this would have a lot of impacts on agriculture as we started to shift to, you know, from the hunting and gathering to agriculture. So first off, you're going to eliminate species in the area that you're going to use to farm, okay? So a lot of native plants are going to get considered weeds, so they're going to be tossed aside. They're not going to be welcomed there. They're considered weeds today, all right? Um, some species of animals that depend on those plants, greater prairie chicken is one example, they're going to get pushed out. Okay, and then the land is altered drastically. The best example I can think of is the prairie, because I'm initially from Illinois that used to be the prairie state. Still is known as that, but most of our prairie is actually long gone. So drainage tiles 
are used to um, drain the actual wetlands and so forth. And they're not tiles in the sense of flat tiles the way we think of them. They're basically clay tubes with holes in them that you put under the ground and then the water drains to them and then the water is carried from the fields to the creeks nearby and the creeks to the rivers and so forth. So, But what that does is prairies used to be super wet, but once they've been drained, the plant composition changes and then that can be used for farmland. You can imagine that once you had a prairie, okay, where you had hundreds of thousands of different species of plants and insects and mammals and so forth, and then you go to a monoculture that that's, you know, where you just have corn, okay, where sprayed for weeds, nothing else is really allowed to live there, that it's going to have a huge shift on the environment. And all those species that used to depend on that prairie, insects, birds, vertebrates, plants, now get pushed out and they don't have anywhere to go. One of my favorite examples of birds that I'm hoping will eventually come back are the greater prairie chicken. So what you see here, the light pink, used to be the extent of the prairie many, many years ago. Then there's the middle, I'm sorry, the, the lighter purple. Then there is the middle purple, which is the extent of the prairie before humans moved in, just before. Now the dark purple, that's the current distribution of the prairie. Now if you look at Illinois, right smack in the middle, it used to be covered in prairie. Okay, and in this day and age, it's all the way down to just that little tiny specks, which is hardly any. So greater prairie chickens that used to be found all over are not found any longer. Now, what I'm going to try and find for video for you, because these guys have the cutest mating dance ever. They do what's called lecking, where they will stand, or booming, where they will stand on some sort of stump, and then they'll stomp their little feet, and it's super cute. And um, personally, I just think they're adorable, and they're one of the species that I seriously hope comes back um, and starts doing really well. As we um, started growing all these crops and we, we started to cultivate them, we selected for a lot of traits that we preferred. One example, of course, is corn. So corn that, that we know and love today, maize that we know and love today, came initially from a plant called teosinte, which is shown on the right here. Okay, and so if you look at the teosinte versus the maize, which is the corn today, you can see there's a big difference between the two. So teosinte has a whole bunch of branches, corn does not. Um, the ears on corn are much bigger than teosinte. In fact, if you look at the inset on the upper right, you can see the teosinte is on the right and corn's on the left. So we drastically altered this through the process of artificial selection. And so this is completely driven by us. So the reason we know this is that teosinte still exists in its regular form. I think it's still found naturally in Mexico and a few other places, which from a science perspective is really cool. Whether you know it or not, kale, kohlrabi, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, all of these plants and Brussels sprouts are actually related, and they all came from a plant that was called wild mustard, okay, due to selection, artificial selection by humans. So we selected for flowers um, to clusters, that's what produced the um, cauliflower. We selected for large leaves, that's what produced the kale, a bigger stem that produced kohlrabi. So all of these you know, plants tend to be grouped in your um, grocery store and the reason they tend to be grouped together is because of the fact they're all related, so that's kind of why they're there. Strawberries have been incredibly altered by humans and so initially they were written about by the Romans and even Darwin wrote about them. They were very small but very flavorful. The strawberries that we know and love today in grocery stores are actually a hybrid of two different species. One of them came from Chile, another one I think from France if I remember correctly, and what we selected for was durability, was size and color. So they're probably not as tasty as they used to be back in the day, but now you can actually ship them in grocery stores from one area to the next or ship them to grocery stores. And that was actually a big deal, whereas before you couldn't actually do that. So from a science perspective, really interesting. Technically fruits to be drastically altered by humans are tomatoes. Now tomatoes, the plants used to look like the one in the upper right, okay, which is very different than ones we have today. So tomatoes, you can imagine the ones that are seen in the grocery stores, they were selected for traits for durability as one of them, size was another, and color. And you can really compare this and get an idea of what they used to look like when you consider the heirloom tomatoes. Now, 
I like to garden, even though I'm not that good at it. <laughs> I do enjoy it. I will tell you, I've tried growing heirloom tomatoes, and I am terrible at it. And I swear I just stink at that. So the heirloom varieties tend to be very sensitive. I totally understand <laughs> why they've been altered, because the normal ones I can grow and they do just fine. Okay, so, but the heirloom varieties have a lot different color. They have a lot different sizes, a lot different tastes, and so forth. Um, whereas the ones that are in the grocery stores tend to be more standard. Well, that's all selection completely driven by humans. So the next time you guys go to the store, check out the heirloom varieties and then check out the regular tomatoes and see how they differ. And you can definitely see a difference. Another thing to note is that tomatoes are very, very highly genetically diverse in the wild ones. So there's a lot more traits um, humans could potentially select for with regards to tomatoes, which is pretty awesome. Now, there are some negative sides to domestication, whether we realize it or not. And the perfect example I can think of this comes with the Irish potato famine. So I don't know about all of you who have Irish descent. I don't, actually. My, my people were German <laughs> um, and Scandinavian, at least as my father would tell me. But those of you that have Irish descent might have come on over here, had ancestors come over here because of the Irish potato famine. So the way that happened is potatoes were a large staple for the Irish people back in the day. But unfortunately, a fungus came through, okay? Now, potatoes, um, the potatoes that were used by Ireland all tend to be genetically uniform back then because they were reliable, they produced a lot of food, and, you know, everybody was happy. Well, because they were so genetically uniform, that was a problem because then a virus would come through, and what started to happen is it would rot the potatoes before they could be pulled out of the ground. Once that started to happen, millions of people starved to death, which was a negative thing, and that's why many of the Irish, um, those with Irish ancestry, might have come over to the U.S. and spread out to other areas in search of food so they could survive. So check out your family history if you have any Irish descent. It's kind of interesting to know if your family came over for that particular reason. Another really awesome example of artificial selection, and I say this as I'm sitting here rubbing a dog's belly <laughs> sitting on my lap right now, um, is the transition of wolves to the breeding for dogs. Okay, so this to me is actually pretty interesting. Um, the reason, as far as why dogs initially started to hang out with humans, there's a couple different hypotheses. One was that they started to invade our trash, and then we just let them associate with us, and then in return, they would warn us if there were any big scary predators around. Um, other cultures suggest that maybe we started to domesticate them and like having company around and then we started to use them for hunting skills, okay? So a lot of the first dog breeds that came about, which in Europe, North America, as you can say here, a lot of those were the working dogs, okay? So the hunting dogs, those that helped people with hunting or doing other jobs or killing rodents or something like that. And it was only relatively recently that that second wave of selection came about, which is illustrated at the bottom of this slide, where we started to have the toy and the frou-frou breeds. And I can say this because I own three frou -frou breed dogs. <laughs> So <laughs> they are very uh, noisy and very um, lazy, and that's okay, but they, they're not really bred for anything working. They were bred more for, to, to keep humans um, company, so they were bred for companionship and loyalty and that type of thing. So um, there were two main waves of breeding dogs back in the day, um, at least it's been suggested according to the data. So interestingly, there are 350 dog breeds today. By the way, these are all caused by humans, all right? So many of them through artificial selection. Many of them were used to perform tasks like hunting or killing rodents or something like that. Most of them have been bred over the last 200 years. A genetic analysis suggests that there's 40 different genetic reason, regions of the genome that we've selected for traits. We've selected for morphological traits like body size and coat color. Here you can see a Great Dane versus a Chihuahua. Once again, that's all done by humans. Now, as these traits were selected for physically, we also selected for certain behavioral traits. For example, we wanted them to be tame. If they were too wild, we didn't want them to be aggressive towards us. We also wanted them to be sensitive to human behavior. I don't know if any of you have dogs for pets or, you know, with your family or anything like that, but I swear my dogs have a large vocabulary and they know what I'm going to do half the time before I do. They also were bred for a desire to please, okay? So they would... <laughs> 
<laughs> My husband's chiming in. Our dogs are a little spoiled, so they may not always have a desire to please humans. Ours, eh, a little questionable, but a lot of them by large were bred for a desire to please humans, and that's why they tend to be so in tune with us, whereas wolves, by the way, not so much because they weren't bred for that and they weren't selected for, which is actually quite interesting. Now, as we've analyzed dogs genetically, we've analyzed their genome all different ways, including not just the genetic pattern, but gene expression, okay? Gene expression is measured by what's called a heat map, and this is a heat map. When genes are expressed, that means that they're actually turned on to produce proteins and give us all of our charming characteristics, and the same for dogs. And what I want you to get out of this is the dog breeds are actually lined up here, okay, for a particular reason. So look at the right side of this. You see the hunting group, okay, then you see the mountain group, then you see the terrier group, okay, so, and then you see the ancient group that was um, selected for in China. Wherever there's the red, okay, each of those little lines represents a different breed of dogs. And wherever there's the red, that means they share genes being turned on. Wherever there's the blue, that means they share genes being turned off. So the hunting group, which is down at the bottom right corner, all of that red means that those genes tend to be turned on for those particular breeds. Okay, so they all share that gene expression. Then you get to the Mastiff Terrier group and so forth. So much like you would expect, their genes, you know, that control certain traits are similar, okay, to one another, all these different breeds that perform these different tasks, which pretty awesome from a scientific perspective. Now, in order for artificial selection to take place, and by the way, these are pigeons, which Darwin worked with when he came up with the idea of natural selection. One of the first things he noticed is that breeders of pigeons could select for certain traits, okay? So what he also noticed is that in order for artificial selection to work, you have to have a couple of different things. First off, you gotta have variation. If everybody's identical, then it's just identical and there's nothing to select for or against. But then the variation must be heritable. Now heritable means it gets passed on from one generation to the next to the next. So in order to be able to artificially select for traits, you gotta have genetic variation and that variation has to be heritable. Now cats um, have evolved with humans as well. And I don't know if any of you out there happen to be cat owners. So I have both. I had a cat sitting on my lap earlier today in the beginning of the lecture. Um, however, cat evolution is very different than dog evolution. So cats started to hang around humans right about the time we switched to agriculture. Okay, and the reason we wanted them to stay around is that the rodents tend to find our stores of grain. And then the cats would eat the rodents and keep the rodents out of our food. Okay, so it was sort of a mutualistic relationship. However, we didn't breed them to necessarily be, be, pay attention to human behavior or pick up on our cues or necessarily be tame. So if you guys have ever had cats for pets and dogs for pets, you'll notice that they can be very, very different. Cats can be very independent. Um, they don't necessarily have them selected for certain traits for them the way we have with dogs. Um, however, only recently are we starting to select for traits, you know, physical traits in cats the way we do for dogs, but that's why some of them only came about recently. Ancient Egyptians revered cats because they were great at keeping the mice away, which would have then keep disease away. Um, you know, and different cultures have different beliefs. However, you know, there's this old saying that if you die, a cat will eat you and a dog will mourn you. <laughs> Not really surprised, you know, <laughs> that that might be the truth. Um, cats are a little bit more independent, but again, that's because they were bred for that. So there's a reason. So you might be asking yourself, where did all this domestication first happen and where did it take place? Well, my response to that would be an excellent question. Um, initially, it happened in what was called the Fertile Crescent. Okay, and if you look at this map here, I can kind of show you where the Fertile Crescent happens to be on a world map. And from a practical perspective, what does it mean to be domesticated? Well, that means that you have to have genes that better suit humans, okay? And this happened to be, you know, early in the areas when we shifted to agriculture, which again is in the Fertile Crescent. And a lot of, there's a lot of fossil evidence to suggest where that's a lot of our domesticated species first appeared, which is pretty cool. So you might be asking yourself again, what does it mean to be domesticated? Well, think of all the species we've domesticated. They had to, in some way or another, be genetically altered to benefit man. Okay, cows we selected for docile and meat quality, chickens the same. When it came to grains, we selected to make sure that the um, grains would shatter simultaneously so we could harvest them and have, you know, a good crop and so forth. So in order to be domestic, that means you have to be genetically altered in some way to better suit humans. 
So you guys might be asking yourself, why weren't certain other animal species domesticated? And I would say, aha, excellent question. Well, there's a variety of reasons. First off, we know that horses are definitely domesticated, but why not zebras? Well, if you've ever worked with zebras, if you talk to someone who has, apparently they have a rather nasty disposition. And those of them that work with them in zoos say that they will actually bite you and not want to let go of you until you're dead. <laughs> okay, so that's a reason not to domesticate those guys. Initially as well, there are reindeer which are domesticated, but elk are not. Well, the reason is because that reindeer are relatively easy to tame. Elk have an instinct when they panic to potentially bolt, okay? And unfortunately, they will hurt themselves sometimes if you're trying to enclose them. And so elk just don't work out to be domesticated. You might also be asking, why is it we... Um, have domesticated almonds but not necessarily oaks and acorns because next time you guys walk on campus someday we'll get to do so again there are so many acorn oak trees around with tons of acorns well it turns out that acorn and acorns have a lot of toxins or tannins in them that are produced by the oak trees and in order for us to actually use them and make anything out of the acorns you have to grind them up and then rinse them thoroughly to get rid of those tannins and toxins and then you can basically make them into a bread or something like that but squirrels have been able to eat them we can't just outright eat them because they will make us sick so that just gives you an example of why certain species happen to be domesticated whereas others are not which I personally find fascinating now as we know and as we have proven firsthand um, there are consequences of agriculture and domestication and one example of that would be diseases that get transferred from one species to another. For example, measles and tuberculosis apparently came from cattle, at least according to the fossil record. Influenza came from pigs, smallpox might have come from camels or cattle, just kind of depends. Um, and as we know, our coronavirus unfortunately seems to have come from bats. Again, bats are awesome. We have bat friends. They can eliminate disease for air, from areas for us. However, you don't want to get too close to them, and that's definitely a good reason not to get too close to bats. and Just kind of let them do their thing and hunt the insects, and then everybody's happy. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of negative impacts of diseases on humans. One of the perfect examples, and to me one of the most interesting, is the impact of the European settlers on the Native Americans. So, as we know, unfortunately, Native American populations throughout history were not treated fairly, nor were they treated well. Um, and that part is sad. My husband actually is part Native American in him. And my history, I have... Um, uh, some of my ancestors were the early settlers, so my husband pokes fun at me because my ancestors, unfortunately, we had been in urban locations, urban environments, we'd been exposed to many diseases, and when the settlers initially came over and started interacting with the Native Americans, unfortunately, they brought with them many of those diseases. And there's one hypothesis that not only did we impact the Native Americans in a negative way because we, our ancestors, um, forced them off of their land, but also because we exposed them to many diseases that they'd never been exposed to before, which of course was a very negative thing. So unfortunately, you know, we can carry diseases with us as we all know, particularly at this time period. So all right, um, this is the last lecture for this week, and so I am still grading your exams. I will have your exam grades back to you by Monday, okay? And then you can use Monday to decide if you're going to want to take the final exam or not. Um, Monday, I'm going to give you another quiz. That's going to be your last quiz. Don't forget the final exam will be comprehensive, but you'll at least know your exam grade, your second exam grade, and where you sit. And then you can kind of make the decision on whether or not you guys wish to take the final exam. So um, if you guys happen to like this lecture, by the way, and you're curious about it, I do offer a class on this where we focus entirely on the impact of humans on our environment. It's just a 100-level mini course. Um, so if you're interested, let me know. I, I like teaching it. It's a lot of fun. And I'm also writing a book on this. And so if you guys want a copy of the book once I'm done with it, you can also let me know and I will give you a copy of it on a PDF file. So I always find this topic interesting. And if you guys do too, just let me know. Stay safe. Have a wonderful weekend. And I will talk to you next week.